So things went to from bad to really bad when I started using heroin intravenously. Um, obviously, it just required every minute of my time to feed my addiction and just at this point and able to not be sick because once you're at that threshold of addiction you're no longer getting high I would say it's all about not being sick you that you're just that's your fear is being sick because you just hate it you despise it and obviously the more you use the worse sick you become so I'm out there and I start intravenously using it to, because it's a lot stronger. It lasts a lot longer. It's just it's just a whole different ball game. And so, of course, I was with somebody at the time, and they tried. They basically taught me into it. Hey, man, you've got to try it this way because if you do it like this, you'll never do it any other way. This is what's gonna. This is this is like being God. This is how you make you. It's gonna make you feel like you're God. And so, at the, you know, I ended up trying it. And after I tried it, I never again did it any other way. And so, uh, at this point, having to make money, you know, I was hustling, selling a lot of it. I knew a couple boys that were like in the Mexican cartel running from the area I was born and raised in. And so they had a constant supply and they would, uh, you know, asked me to go to New Jersey with them, basically be a tester for them. And so we'd just make a, you know, three-day trip basically there. I would test the stuff, basically tell them it's good. And then they would just get ridiculous amounts and then turn around and come back. And so having those two connects, and they were brothers, having those two connects was just bad because now I have this constant connect of very, probably closest thing to pure as I've ever seen or came close to or anything. And so that really was bad. And so things got crazy. I mean, it got to the point, I'm stealing from my own family, uh, you know, stealing guns, pawning guns, TVs from my own friends, laptops from my own friends, whatever I had to do to be able to afford that next fix, I was gonna do it. And basically that stuff takes your soul, I would say. You just don't have a conscience anymore. It's gone, there's no right or wrong. You're just living to not be sick. You're living for this horrible addiction. And it's during this time, you know it too. I mean, you know you're really bad off when you get track marks up and down your arms and legs and you just, driving around jamming nirvana and you're just in a real dark place depressed i mean you get suicidal at times for sure there's many times you know i just you know during this whole period too i would pray at night and ask god to take this from me just take this thing from me whatever this is why i keep using please take it from me or take me out because I didn't want to do it anymore you know what I mean it was like I mean I remember coming out of rehab thinking if I mess praying if I mess up just let it be the last time I ever mess up let this be it I don't want to let my family down don't want to let me down I'm just sick of it I'm sick of it and uh luckily he didn't he had other plans but um yeah what <laughs> so you st- you still like you never lost faith in God even in the midst of your addiction, like what was what were your thoughts on God through all that? I knew He was there. I mean, I knew He, I knew that He was there. I prayed a lot to Him, even though I was strung out, really bad off. I would still pray, even though I knew I was doing wrong. But it was a sick. I was sick, very sick. I mean, there would be times that I'd be crying out to Him, driving in the car, you know, begging, basically Him to take this thing from me on the way to get drugs. And then as soon as I get it, I would do them and then be laughing about the whole thing. I mean, it was a very sick addiction that, you know, I had. And, um, but yeah, I knew he was there always. <clears throat> and did you have friends that you grew up with that were in the same exact boat as you or? Yeah, I had a couple running buddies I grew up with where we, like I said before, it's like a ring of people and so 
at this time I had known, you know, these Puerto Rican cats that were in the Mexican cartel or whatever. So I was basically their source to that. And so all day, my day consists of getting them, you know what I mean? I would get a lump sum and then I would disperse it throughout and that would be able to me afford another lump sum and then disperse it out. And these guys I was pretty tight with at a time, they were able to, they just fronted me basically because they knew I'd, they knew I'd get the money somehow, some way I'd pay them back, no matter how much it was, you know, and that's a bad, it's a bad place to be. <clears throat> how did you link with them in the first place before you came there, became the I think it was uh, my older sister who had struggles with addiction somebody she dealt with was a family member of theirs something crazy along that line uh, my older sister didn't deal with them directly but she dealed with their uncle and so I don't really remember the details but somehow I got linked up with these two Puerto Rican dudes that were really deep in it and um, yeah it was it was a crazy experience um, but I'm trying to think where to go from here. Uh, so just, you know. So I guess what was your rock bottom or how many rock bottoms did you have? I hit rock bottom a bunch of times. <laughs> I mean, I've been to rehab, I lost count. I don't know, like 25 or 28, I think I lost count. And I'll be, you know, these, and all these times having to detox before going there. So there came, it became to a point where all I would do was get strung out just long enough. I'd get strung out and I would detox. And as soon as I started feeling better, get strung out, I'd detox. I'd get strung out, I'd de So it was just constant flow of being violently sick for probably months and months and months. And it was not good. Uh, it was just, it was a bad place to be. I didn't see a way out of it. I thought, you know, and even from a younger age, when I was in my 20s, when I was using just the Oxycontin for, re for fun at this time, not really physically dependent, I just thought in my head for some reason, like I'm doing this stuff at such a young age, I'm either, I'm going to end up dead or in prison. That's what's gonna happen. I, I, didn't, I didn't doubt it. I didn't even, like at that point, I was like, I'm not even gonna fight it. Whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. But this is the life I'm gonna lead because I the very high highs and very low lows, but that's what I, I mean, that was before it even got real bad. I had that in my thoughts. It's so wild to think about that because you, you hear people from like really bad environments or, you know, upbringings that have that same mind frame, like I'm either going to end up dead or in jail, whereas you are saying you were raised in a great environment, you know, great parents, believed in God, and you still came to that place. Yeah, I I don't I don't right. I think uh, I don't really. It, I got there really quickly. I don't know how it happened. To be honest with you, and, and I ended up it being in those places. That was where I'd hang out though, in the hoods and the in the ghettos, and that was where I would be in and out every day, all day. You know, being at these rough places where, like you said, most people that do come out of there are in this lifestyle. Well, I've left a nice lifestyle in a nice neighborhood and made that my lifestyle and ditch, you know, for, I didn't think what, I didn't think my actions would get me there, being young and just using for recreational fun. But looking back, I should have known in high school when I experimenting, but I'm experimenting with harder drugs, but I should have known when I was always the one that wanted to get more. I was always the one that stayed up the latest. I want to get more and more and more. I could not have enough. No matter what it was, I was always the one, you know, other people, all right, party's over, time to go to bed. And I'm, oh, no, I got another hundred bucks. Let's go get some more. And I, that sort of was a huge red flag, but I didn't know what it meant. You know what I mean? It was just like I'm definitely different from these other people. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but later to find out it was, I'm just an addictive personality, I guess. I'm sure in the beginning, some people might have liked that, though, like life of the party type situation. Right, oh, yeah, yeah, a lot of people loved it and had a lot of parties at my house. Had a lot of, you know, had a lot of fun, but if I would have known what that led to, I would have never done any of that. You when know, the party I mean? ended. Right, the party ended, and it, and yeah. When do you think you realized the party ended? When you were when I was laying on, you know, the floor in a detox, butt naked, just crying out in pain, and just 
having old ladies run in there and ch <clears throat> check on me, make sure I was alive. <laughs> and uh, I mean, that's when I really knew things were bad. Like, I don't, I don't know how I'm gonna get out of this. And again, you know, these times I leave these, go to detox, go to rehab, I would leave these places really thinking, I got it, I'm not gonna mess up. I'm gonna do everything they tell me to do. I'm gonna go to 60 days and 60, 60 meetings, 60 days. I'm gonna get a sponsor, I'm gonna go to meeting. I'm gonna do everything they ask me to do, read the NA book, AA book, and I would do it, but I would do it, it would only, it, it didn't keep me sober. Three days later, I'd be right back on the train every time. It was, it was, and it got discouraging eventually after doing that so many times, it was almost like, I don't know, you know what I mean? I, I don't know, I didn't think, I didn't know what was gonna happen. I didn't see a way out of it. Not to mention, during the end of this process, um, later on, when I'm real deep in it, uh, there's many instances I was ODing, and many times I'd wake up in a hospital being revived and have no recollection of why I got there, and then basically tell me, you know, we just, saved your life and then I would come to and I would be mainly pissed because I'm not high anymore and they, you know when they give you Narcan it brings you out of that and so I would as soon as I'd walk out the door and leave I'd go do it again and as many times I'd come to and I wouldn't I wouldn't know how I got there you know I mean I don't I don't know who I was with I don't know where I was you know what I mean it was just like it was bad and um, I mean one certain Situation, I met a guy at a party. I had been clean for a little bit, maybe a week. You know, this is one of the times, longer times I'd been clean out of rehab. Maybe a week at the most. Met this guy at a party and I'm drinking, you know. I, I was drinking at a party and uh, even though I shouldn't have been because I was just at a rehab. But, um, you know, he said something and I was the only one that caught it. Something about getting something, whatever. So I ended up leaving with him to go get something. And uh, next thing you know, ambulance is picking me up. I guess hit me with Narcan. I wake up and they're basically like, that old lady saved your life out front of that neighborhood that's deep in the hood. The dude you were riding with pulled you out on the sidewalk and was leaving you and she saw it. And luckily she called the ambulance and just saved your life. And that, that was really scary when I had heard that and my face all busted up, all scarred up and everything, I guess from him dragging me out. So he just dragged you out of the car? And yeah, he just dragged me out of the car because he, he didn't want it to ruin his party, I guess, you know what I mean? That, you know, but that was just one instance. There was plenty of instances that were similar to that one. But I just didn't have any, uh, I just didn't care about living anymore at that point.